Debris strewn across a Chicago sidewalk after an apparent building explosion sent at least eight people to the hospital, three of them critical. What we know about the blast is police and ATF agents swarm the scene. The battle over immigration intensifies. More arrests than ever along the southern border. Democrats accuse the governors of Texas and Florida of human trafficking migrants sent on planes and buses across the country. Now a criminal investigation is launched into Governor Ron DeSantis' actions. Tonight, our Rachel Scott presses the president for solutions. On the border, why is the border more overwhelmed under your watch, Mr. President? Because there are three countries that are never had. There are fewer. There are fewer immigrants coming from Central America than from Mexico. This is a totally different circumstance. Hurricane Fiona strengthens to a Category 3 as it tears across the Caribbean, set to slam Turks and Caicos and then the Bahamas. The hurricane, packing winds of up to 115 miles per hour, could grow to a Cat 4 by tomorrow. Our Ginger Z is tracking the path as Victor Kendo reports from Puerto Rico, where two-thirds of the island are still without power. Our exclusive journey deep into the hills of Idaho to the mine ushering in a new era. Why what happens there could be key in our race toward an all-electric future in America. And I think we have a responsibility to continue to do what's challenging. You know, we don't do this because it's easy. We actually do it because it's incredibly hard and we want to see it done right. After their water system failed them, the residents of Jackson, Mississippi, have filed the first federal class action lawsuit. We talked to a woman who says the failure impacted her personally and professionally. Professional political analyst, entrepreneur, and real housewife. Our conversation with Dr. Wendy Osefo as she makes her mark in the world of education and entertainment. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis reporting in tonight from Los Angeles. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We begin with the bitter political showdown over immigration with less than 50 days until the midterms. And now a criminal investigation is underway. The sheriff of Bear County in Texas is looking into those two flights that took off last week from San Antonio and landed on Martha's Vineyard in Massachusetts. He wants to know whether the 48 migrants on board were misled and whether any laws were broken. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, a potential 2024 hopeful, has taken credit for the flights and the message he wants to send to Democrats, but told ABC News today that the allegations the sheriff is probing are, quote, false. At the same time, President Biden is under increasing pressure with border apprehensions hitting an all-time high. We also learned late today that a civil rights class action lawsuit was filed on behalf of those migrants, and Governor DeSantis is named. We'll speak with that Texas sheriff in a moment, but we begin with ABC's Rachel Scott and what President Biden told him just this afternoon. Tonight, the Biden administration pressed to explain the historic surge of migrants arrested at the southern border. More than two million apprehensions in just one year, the largest number ever. The president telling me the U.S. is seeing an increase in people fleeing political oppression. On the border, why is the border more overwhelmed under your watch, Mr. President? There are fewer immigrants coming from Central America and from Mexico. This is a totally different circumstance. What's on my watch now is Venezuela, Cuba, and Nicaragua. The administration says the migrants are escaping failing communist regimes, and sending them back there is not an option. The president insists he's working with other countries to stop the flow. But border cities like El Paso, Texas are overwhelmed. Shelters at capacity, people sleeping on the streets. El Paso now busing migrants up north. With just under 50 days to go until the midterms, Republican governors sensing a political opportunity. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis flew nearly 50 migrants from San Antonio to the liberal enclave of Martha's Vineyard, making sure cameras were there to capture the scene. They were provided um, an ability to be in the, the most posh sanctuary jurisdiction maybe in the world. Democrats accused DeSantis of turning desperate people into political pawns, but the Florida governor is defiant promising more of those flights in the days to come. He is not backing down. Rachel Scott joins us now. Rachel, any idea how much taxpayer money Governor DeSantis has spent on these flights? Yes, Lindsay. Well, Florida Republicans redirected about $12 million in federal COVID relief funds to pay for those migrant flights. And I can tell you that despite those legal challenges, you are right. Governor Ron DeSantis, he is not backing away from this. He plans to use every single penny of that, Lindsay. And of course, there continues to be mounting legal pressure against Governor DeSantis. What is this latest lawsuit about? 
Yeah, this latest one is coming from civil rights lawyers who filed it on behalf of those migrants. They say that they were targeted, that, that they were induced, that uh, they were promised uh, in false, false opportunities when they landed jobs, housing, and even the people they say that coerced them to board those flights disappeared and those migrants were left wondering what happened, Lindsay. All right, Rachel Scott reporting from the White House for us tonight. Thanks so much, Rachel. Joining us now is Bear County Sheriff Javier Salas, our sheriff. Thank you so much for coming back on the show. Uh, you've opened up a criminal investigation into this Martha's Vineyard flight. Have you questioned the parties involved who you suspect lured migrants out of the Migrant Resource Center? No, up to now, we've we've communicated with the attorneys representing the folks in this case that, that, that we're considering to be potential victims and witnesses. Uh, we do want to get firsthand accounts from these folks to the extent possible. So right now, we're in the planning stages uh, for that. We do have some persons of interest tentatively identified by name, one, at least one of them by name. I'm not at liberty to give those names. And then with some of them, we just have pictures of, and we're trying to get them identified. One of our political embed reporters in Florida, Miles Cohen, caught up with Governor DeSantis during a presser. He asked him specifically about you. I'd like to play a clip. How would you respond to the sheriff in Texas who's saying that these migrants were lured under false pretenses to boarding those planes? Yes, that's false. If you heard him there, he said that's false, that they were lured under false pretenses. That was the response to being asked about migrants being lured there. What's your reaction to that? Well, I, you know, look, the governor's got his opinion of what occurred. At some point, I'm going to get a good firsthand account of what occurred. And, and maybe the governor and I just have to agree to disagree on the facts of the case. Do you consider the transportation of these migrants to be human trafficking? Well, it could be. Uh, you know, once we get to talk to these folks uh, in person and we find out exactly what was said and done while they were here in Bear County, because let's be frank, that's the only part of this, this whole incident that I have any control over is what physically occurred in my county. If we're able to prove up that they were, they were transported from here under false pretenses, uh, that could, uh, uh, could be tantamount to criminal conduct and it'll be dealt with accordingly. A lack of resources seems to be really the recurring theme with our immigration system and the border. How far do you plan to take this criminal investigation? And does your county have the resources to possibly build a case against a sitting governor of another state if the evidence calls for that? Well, look, I think it's a bit of a stretch at this point to say that we're putting a case on the, on the, on the governor. Uh, we've actually never said that. What, what, I, what I do plan is finding out what did the people that were physically here in my county, what did they say and do to these people? And those are the folks that I, say, I can say we're concentrating our efforts on. Beyond that, I don't know what, what may become necessary, but I can tell you that uh, we will have to make resources uh, you know, to, to hold folks accountable. At this point, I can't say that I'm going to be holding anybody outside of my county responsible for anything. Uh, but once, once it comes to that point, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. You'll follow wherever the investigation leads, it sounds like. And we had you on our show almost three months ago after that horrible human smuggling tragedy that left 53 dead. You were sounding the alarm well mm -hmm. before then. You've written three letters to President Biden. Here you are sounding the alarm again. Uh, you told us that you had reached out, but did you ever have a, a concrete meeting or any kind of true correspondence? No, there really hasn't been an, uh, a meaningful meeting uh, to this point. I mean, we, we did receive, I did receive a phone call from somebody uh, in the administration that, that we tried to, tried to get something going and it just never came to fruition. And quite frankly, we've had two additional deaths in my county since then that we know of that we're handling. Uh, and so the problem is still there. It's not going anywhere anytime soon. And these problems, like what we're confronting right now, are, are kind of offshoot issues uh, from, the, from the big main issue that we've, we've got a humanitarian crisis going on. How do you feel that that should be, or what are at least some initial steps in trying to solve and tackle that crisis? Well, you know, realizing I'm not the president, realizing I'm not a sitting governor, I'm a cop, uh, I can bring some, some what I think are common sense approaches from a 30-year from a cop's perspective. Uh, and I'm certainly willing to do that. I'll give my opinion to whoever asks for it, and maybe even some people that don't ask for it are going to get it. Um, but, but certainly, I'm, I'm, I, I, I don't purport to have all of the solutions, but I'm willing to be part of the solution if somebody will just uh, you know, come to Texas and, and let's discuss it. Bear County Sheriff Javier Salazar, we thank you so much for your time.
Thank you. Be safe. Tonight, Hurricane Fiona is still gaining strength as it lashes Turks and Caicos and then makes its way north. Bermuda now potentially in its crosshairs. This is after Fiona pounded the Dominican Republic and Puerto Rico. Crews in Puerto Rico spent the day working to restore power to residents as floodwaters began to recede. But tonight, much of the island remains without power. Victor Akendo reports once again tonight from Puerto Rico. Tonight, Fiona pounding Turks and Caicos with 115 mile per hour winds and up to eight feet of storm surge. Fiona already tearing a path of destruction through the Dominican Republic. In Puerto Rico, new video showing the Coast Guard assessing the damage Monday. We're in Toa Baja. It's a town not too far from San Juan, and this is what it looks like two days after Hurricane Fiona made landfall here. As much as 30 inches of rain in some areas already, up to four inches more expected tonight. In Utuado, where raging floodwaters destroyed that bridge, this is what it looks like today. That bridge was temporary, built after Hurricane Maria destroyed the previous one in 2017. I just feel trapped because the other way is, is broken too, so we have to go around. Roads in the area, treacherous. The U.S. territory's already fragile power grid devastated. Tonight, about 80% of customers are in the dark. This crew from Luma Energy is working on some damaged power lines here in San Juan. Take a look up at the bucket truck. They tell me this is happening across all of Puerto Rico. The power can't come back soon enough for Minerva Marquez Villalongo. Everything she owns now, she's moved it up here into these bags. She had to protect it from the floodwaters that came inside of her house. The 81-year-old has several medical conditions. She'll stay with her daughter until power is restored, happy to have family to lean on. <laughs> One thing that's left intact is her smile. Victor Akendo joins us now from Puerto Rico. Victor, the long road to recovery now underway. Where do things stand with the power grid tonight? Lindsay, that is no doubt going to take some time. Here in Toa Baja, parts of it are still underwater as residents begin the painful cleanup process. Luma Energy says that between tonight and tomorrow, large parts of Puerto Rico should have its power restored. But because Fiona pounded the island with so much rain for so long, the response time was delayed. Lindsay? All right. Victor Akendo, our thanks to you. And let's get right to Chief Meteorologist Ginger Z, who is tracking this hurricane and another storm that's brewing tonight. Hey, Ginger. Hey there, Lindsay. It was just so nice having such a slow summer, but boy, is the Atlantic making up for it. We just saw Gaston named. It'll be a fish storm, but that is about two plus weeks behind average activity. So Fiona, obviously doing so much damage throughout the Caribbean and now moving north of Turks and Caicos, is the next one we are concerned about going too close to Bermuda. So we kind of forecast there, future casted it till 5 a.m. on Friday. So that's when the proximity is close enough that it could cause big issues, pushing water, dropping a lot of rain, and having some wind. For mainland U.S., it's going to be far enough away that as long as you're not in the water, in the ocean, you should be fine. Rip currents, though, and high surf going to be an issue from Miami through the Outer Banks, the Mid-Atlantic, and up through coastal New England. I do want to take you, though, to the next map, and this is the one that looks super active and unfortunate because this looks much more like the activity we've seen the last couple of years. You see that X just north of South America? That's the next tropical wave, or now it's already been named an invest or an area that they're investigating. And we look at the computer models, these spaghetti plots, and most of them take it into the Western Caribbean. That would be by early next week. And then by late next week, the two models we love for long term, both taking it into the Gulf. So we'll be watching that. We've got nine, ten days before that comes to fruition. But still, it is something to keep in mind because we are right in the heart of hurricane season, Lindsay. Right, that map just all lit up there. Ginger, our thanks to you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. In Chicago, an apartment building explosion tore through homes and sent eight people to the hospital, three of them in critical condition. The blast almost completely took out the top floor windows left shattered. Our Alex Perez is on the scene with what we know. Piles of rubble and blown out windows. Investigators in Chicago tonight sifting through the aftermath, trying to determine what caused a massive explosion at this residential apartment building. The West End and Central looks like I have a building that the top floor has exploded. The first emergency calls for help coming in about 9 a.m. Residents terrified. The building was sh shaking and when I opened the door, everybody was running. And uh, I started running too. 
bricks scattered everywhere, the blast frightening those who live nearby. Oh, it was the sound, boom. Then it was the shake. I ran out the house, got to the corner, everybody was rushing. Emergency teams, including ATF and bomb squad, all on scene. They had to shore up the upper floors to search for possible victims. In all, eight people hospitalized, some with severe burns. Right now, we don't know what caused this incident. It's still under investigation. Alex Perez joins us now. Alex, is it still an active scene there? Yeah, Lindsay, you might be able to see it. If you look closely behind me, you might see some flashlights up there at the top of the building. Crews at the ATF and other crews still up there trying to assess this situation. Authorities here say they're thankful that no one was killed. The gas company says they do not believe this was a gas issue. The owner of this building is cooperating with authorities as they work to figure out what went wrong here, Lindsay. Yeah, we can see that activity up there. Alex Perez, our thanks to you as always. Now to the battle over the classified documents retrieved from Mar-a-Lago. The new special master today met with former President Trump's attorneys and lawyers from the Justice Department, pressing Trump's team to provide evidence to support Trump's claims that the documents had been declassified. ABC's Chief Justice Correspondent Pierre Thomas has the latest. Donald Trump was the one who wanted a special master in this case. And tonight, the judge appointed to that role pushing the former president's attorneys to provide evidence he declassified hundreds of documents discovered at his Mar-a-Lago home, many marked secret and top secret. Publicly, Trump has claimed he declassified the documents before leaving office. A president has that absolute right. But Trump's attorneys have not repeated those claims in court or in any legal filings. Judge Raymond Deary essentially telling them it's time to prove it. If the government gives me evidence these are classified documents and you don't advance declassification claims, then as far as I'm concerned, that's the end of it. You can't have your cake and eat it too. Judge Deary pointed to those labels on some of the documents, secret and top secret, saying, if they are on their face classified without any evidence to the contrary, how is it on the court to conclude anything but? and the judge making it clear he considered the handling of classified information a serious matter, saying, the government has a strong obligation to all of us to see that the information doesn't get into the wrong hands. Pierre Thomas joins us now from Washington. Pierre, the Trump team also acknowledged today to the special master that the former president could be indicted. Uh, what did they have to say about that? Well, Trump's attorneys have said they do not want to give details on whether or how Trump might have declassified those documents just yet, because it might be part of their defense should he be indicted, Lindsay. All right, we shall see how it all unfolds. Pierre Thomas, our thanks to you as always. Pleasure. Now to the war in Ukraine, where Russia's Vladimir Putin has addressed his nation to call for young men to join the fight. While officials in eastern regions of Ukraine sympathetic to Russia are making moves to try to separate to become part of Russia. ABC's Tom Sufi Burge reports from Ukraine. Tonight, a major escalation from Vladimir Putin, moving to officially declare large areas of eastern and southern Ukraine part of Russia planning to stage referendum votes starting this week. President Zelensky tonight dismissing the moves as noise and thanking allies for condemning Russia. It comes as Putin suffers heavy battlefield losses. Tonight, Ukrainian troops marching into this newly liberated village in the eastern Donbass region. The White House today slamming Russia's planned referendums as a sham. These are not the actions of a confident country. These are not acts of strength. Quite the opposite. And tonight, the Ukrainian military releasing new video, claiming it shows Russian incendiary bombs raining down on a recently retaken village in the eastern Donbass region. We visited that mass burial site in Izium, revealed after the Russian retreat. There we met Alexander, his son missing for weeks since Russian soldiers raided his apartment. Alexander's son, Alexander, had picked up a Ukrainian military jacket that he found, and potentially that was the only crime he committed in the eyes of the Russian authorities. I had a bad dream, he told us, and then I realised I would never see my son again. Lindsay, Putin was scheduled to make an address tonight, but the speech was suddenly cancelled. Putin is now due to speak tomorrow on the same day that President Biden is expected to address the UN's General Assembly and deliver a powerful rebuke of Putin's war. Lindsay? 
Tom, thank you. When we come back, a heart-stopping moment caught on camera. A crane crushes a car at an intersection with the driver still inside. Making history at Rutgers University and starring in the Real Housewives franchise, Dr. Wendy Acefo tells us about her new memoir, exploring how a complicated relationship with her mother has impacted her success and informed her own parenting. First, the race to end our reliance on fossil fuels. One answer to our problems might be found deep in the hills of Idaho. Ginger Z shows us how a cobalt mine could become a game changer for our environment. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> I you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated ABCNews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at ABCNews.com. And here's to everything ahead. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on the tough questions with straightforward reporting. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. It was an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. Look at the surveillance video that shows the moment a crane came crashing down in New York City, pummeling a car with a woman still inside. Officials say the crane fell while lifting a payload at a construction site, crushing that car. Fortunately, Good Samaritans were able to help get the driver out. She sustained an injury to her hand and a cut on her lip. As the race to produce electric cars and batteries made here in the U.S. ramps up, tonight we want to take you to a place deep in the hills of Idaho that could be critical if we are to end our reliance on fossil fuels. Our chief meteorologist, Ginger Z, has this exclusive look at what will be the first operating cobalt mine in the U.S. in decades. It's a sneak preview from tonight's climate special, Lit, America's Future, which airs right after Prime. Watch these drips here. In the depths of this narrow, winding tunnel sits a vital mineral that could one day help power our renewable future. It's red. Yeah. Tells you you're going deeper. Outside that tunnel, the rolling Rocky Mountains of central Idaho, flanked by miles and miles of beautiful scenery. At this very moment, this land is just luxuriating in the lack of human interaction. Save that tunnel the mud swallowing our boots. Hey, you get your workout in. Yeah. <laughs> Here, 
there is one goal. You came here for the cobalt. We came here for There's the cobalt. There's cobalt in these hills. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Cobalt is an ancient material that is now breathing new life inside this mountain. It's like choose your own adventure. It's not the first time cobalt has made an imprint on this part of Idaho. Cobalt has been mined in this area for a century, starting in the 1940s to build jet engines during the Cold War. Stand clear of jet intakes and jet exhausts. All go aircraft. Cobalt is now deemed critical by the U.S. government. It is one of 50 considered essential for the U.S. economy and national security. Without these minerals, we simply cannot function. Cobalt, so integral here, there was an entire town named for it. This wide open field running along Panther Creek used to be the town of Cobalt. There used to be 250 people living here. Grocery store, school, dance hall, even a movie theater. Now from the 1950s to the 1980s, the people that lived here mostly worked at the mine, the Blackbird Mine. But now it's a stark reminder of just how transient mining can be. And right here is Panther Creek. This is Panther Creek, yes. Follow this winding creek up the mountain from what was the town of Cobalt, and you'll find the mine where it all began, Blackbird. What am I looking at? So that is the former open pit. OK. That's what we would refer to as kind of surface mining. From the early 1900s to the early 80s, Blackbird was ground zero for cobalt mining in the United States. And surface mining, a practice involving an open pit to gather and mine cobalt. That was commonplace at the time and hardly regulated. There's a lot more regulation nowadays. When we talk 50s and 60s, there wasn't that much regulation around it. The federal government actually asked for the mine to happen and produce, produce, produce. And so corners were cut to be able to produce that cobalt. Both above the surface and below, water flowed over these exposed metals and then carried the toxic material into nearby streams, poisoning the water, killing critical fish populations, and leaving the land in ruin. No one mines here anymore, haven't since 1982. And a decade after the mine shut down, the EPA proposed adding this site to a list of the most contaminated places in the country. Now, Blackbird has a new owner, Canadian-based mega mining company, Glencore. The legacy site is a site that operated. It no longer operates, but we still have an environmental obligation. How long does it take to get something like a watershed restored after a blackbird. My experience tells me decades and decades. Wow. The legacy of environmental contamination and destruction from blackbird is well known. We've had local populations of salmon go extinct from the impacts from mining. Wow. Yeah. Cobalt mining as well? Yeah, from cobalt mining specifically. Was blackbird the site? It was. After decades of work by indigenous groups and local restoration crews, the streams are just now recovering. We've come a long way with our environmental regulations to help protect our waterways for both people and for wildlife. But there are some things that we need to keep in our minds as we move forward with this big mineral rush. And here's the wild part. Just on the other side of that historic cobalt blunder, sits what could be the future of domestic cobalt mining with a company called Gervois. From their offices here in Salmon, the mine is about 22 miles west that way as the crow flies, but we're not crows, so we've got to take a, well, let's just say it's not going to be an easy drive to get there. We're surrounded by absolutely gorgeous scenery, rolling mountains, beautiful foliage, but inside these mountains is a critical mineral. That's right. There's actually an amazing supply of critical minerals in the eastern central part of Idaho. Idaho has one of the best known mineralizations of cobalt in the world in what's called the Idaho Cobalt Belt. In 2019, the US produced roughly 500 tons of cobalt, but that wasn't from direct cobalt mining. It was just a byproduct of other mined material. But now, as the need for EVs and battery storage soar, we need significantly more cobalt. Gervois believes that they can quadruple domestic production to 2,000 tons of cobalt each year. But that is still only 10% of our country's demand. Going into the side of a mine like this is 
a very different operation than an open pit. That's undisturbed forest just above us. Uh, it's undisturbed forest just below us. So really, our only disturbance is this face and this portal and the surface facilities that we'll see on so top. So it's way less impactful on the surface part. That's right. You're not blowing up a mountain. That's right. You're keeping a mountain. You're putting tunnels in it. And what we'll do at the end is all of this gets filled. We we cap that portal. We put the slope back. We can revegetate it, and nobody will ever know it was here. This new Gervois project will be the only mine in the United States exclusively focused on cobalt, the first in our country in almost 30 years. We hope to be here for 10 or more years. At the moment, we're permitted for a mine life of seven years. So in we go. At first, it's just a distant hum. Beyond that vent that carries the diesel fumes out of the mine, it gets eerily quiet until... What they're doing here is like a lab? Well, it is. It is a little bit. It's an opportunity for us to learn more about our ore body. So we've drilled a number of holes here. Each one of those holes penetrates our ore body and tells us something about how much cobalt and copper and the width, the thickness of that. What we do with that information is all of that data gets put into really sophisticated computer models that we use to model the ore body so that when we go to mine it, we have the best prediction we can find of what's in front of us. It takes a lot to do this. This it's, is not easy. It's not easy, and it's really technical. What we're seeing, it's still worth it to go in there and get it, right? Absolutely. Because cobalt, especially now, has had such a rise. It has had a rise. It's a really volatile metal just because of the way the market works. But it, it has had a rise. We believe it's going to continue to be in demand. What are we looking for? You've got your flashlight out. Yeah. So sometimes what we can see is mineralization in this, but you can start to see in this structure here, that layer cake. Yeah. So you can see these structures and how the rock has been tipped up by the formation of the mountains. Our mineralization occurs along these seams. It is a fascinating adventure to kind of navigate this labyrinth of tunnels. They anticipate 40,000 feet of tunnels when they're done. And they're thinking they're gonna find enough cobalt to help power and create 2.8 million electric vehicle batteries. The demand for electric cars and better batteries is hotter than ever, making minerals like cobalt highly in demand around the globe. More than two thirds of the world's supplies of cobalt comes from the Democratic Republic of Congo. China has been very strategic in working with partners in the Congo to secure the rights to those mines. They currently own 15 of the 19 cobalt producing mines in the DRC. There have been a lot of reports of child and forced labor in the DRC as well. An urgent reminder that we need to do it right and do it here. This is a rare issue that is uniting both parties. For our national and our economic security, we cannot afford to rely on countries such as Russia and China. It's clearly time for us to get serious about expanding domestic mineral production. Relying on companies like Gervois and oversight from state and federal governments to do it better this time around. We're using advanced tools like autonomous drones for surveying. So these kind of technological advances make a real difference in how we're able to, in a socially responsible way, extract minerals from the earth. The Gervois mine has permits from the state of Idaho, the EPA, and the U.S. Forest Service. They all found that Gervois's plans for treating their wastewater and restoring the area when the mine closes will minimize, but not completely eliminate, the harm to the environment. There's so much beauty. Part of that's beautiful, too, in nature. We have to have that. When you look out here and then you turn to the mine, what is the feeling you get? I get excited. It's not because I don't see the impact that this is having on the land. It's about the fact that I'm excited to be responsible for it. And I think we have a responsibility to continue to do what's challenging. You know, we don't do this because it's easy. We actually do it because it's incredibly hard and we want to see it done right. Lots of excitement there about the potential energization of America. Our thanks to Ginger, and we're looking forward to seeing her entire special lit. America's Future premieres tonight after Prime on ABC News Live and on Hulu. Still ahead here on Prime, Jackson, Mississippi residents file a class action suit over contamination and failure of the city's water system. We speak to one of the plaintiffs about the impact of the water struggles on her family's life and who she believes should be held responsible. And 
escaping an alleged abductor. Dramatic body camera video shows how one woman got away. Plus, with the showdown over immigration escalating in the U.S., we take a closer look at just how many people are crossing the border and where they're coming from by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day, a big moment for the newest branch of our country's military. The Space Force has unveiled their official song, Semper Supra. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. America is being poisoned with fentanyl, and we don't even know it. Just heard my wife screaming. She told me they had just died. 50 to 100 times more potent than morphine. Keep breathing, come on. It's poison, it's pure poison. A few grains of salt worth of fentanyl will kill you. Just my agency has seized enough to kill the entire country. ABC News Live presents Poisoned, America's Fentanyl Crisis. The powerful series, streaming free on ABC News Live. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated ABCNews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at ABCNews.com. Here's to everything ahead. Welcome back, everyone. As we've been reporting, the showdown over immigration is escalating as the midterms approach. But beyond the political debate is a humanitarian crisis and a policy clearly in need of reform. Here's a closer look at border crossings by the numbers. According to newly released data from U.S. Customs and Border Patrol, there have been more than 2 million apprehensions so far this fiscal year, which runs until the end of the month. That total already far surpasses the 1.6 million apprehensions the federal government reported last year, which had set the prior record. Uh, there were nearly 158,000 unique migrant encounters in August, those involving individuals not previously encountered by authorities in the last 12 months. Now that's up 2.2 percent over the July total. Dig a little deeper and it's clear the profile of who is crossing the border has changed. There was a 175 percent year-over-year increase of immigrants from Venezuela, Cuba, and Nicaragua as many flee those authoritarian regimes. At the same time, those arriving from Mexico Mexico and northern Central America declined by 43% compared to a year ago. So far this year, there have been about 1 million migrant removals under Title 42, a public health provision invoked by former President Trump during the pandemic that denies asylum seekers on the grounds of preventing disease. A federal judge blocked an attempt by the Biden administration to lift Title 42 in May. And we still have lots to get to here on Prime tonight. She told police she'd been kidnapped and tortured, but prosecutors say it was all a lie. What new video reveals about the moment police confronted Sherry Papini about the scheme. Plus, the baseball world is mourning the loss of one of its greats. But first, we'll look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com.
much at stake in our world right now. We wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. National parks are incredibly safe places, but crime will happen. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. I know what happened and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Hurricane Fiona, now a Category 3 storm just offshore of the Turks and Caicos Islands today. Earlier, the storm slamming into the Dominican Republic, causing mudslides. And on Puerto Rico, heavy rain and winds leaving at least two dead. More than a 1,000 people rescued by first responders. This drone video from the town of Yaco showing the floodwaters. Hundreds of thousands are still without drinking water or power. As of Tuesday, Luma Energy, the island's utility supplier, estimating roughly 7 in 10 customers are still in the dark. But promising the lights will come back on soon as crews rush to restore power. The territory's governor calling Fiona's damage catastrophic, saying it will take at least a week to survey all the wreckage. For the first time since the pandemic, the United Nations General Assembly is holding a fully in-person session in New York City. Secretary General Antonio Guterres telling nations the world is facing a barrage of problems in the wake of the pandemic. Divides are growing deeper. Inequalities are growing wider. And challenges are spreading farther. President Biden will address world leaders tomorrow. Members of his cabinet say he will call on world leaders to hold Russia accountable for its invasion of Ukraine. Sherry Papini, the California mom who lied to authorities about being kidnapped and tortured, was sentenced to 18 months in prison Monday and learning how her hoax slammed to a grinding halt in August of 2020. In new video obtained by ABC News, we see for the first time as Shasta County Sheriff's investigators confront the woman they have tenderly treated as a victim. In November of 2016, Sherry Papini vanished for 22 days. She told authorities she'd been kidnapped by two Hispanic women. She claimed the women had beaten her, burned her, even branded her on her shoulder. You're accusing two females who abducted you when it was James. The part that you were branded, James did. It wasn't until more than three years later that trace DNA found on Papini led to this mystery man, ex-boyfriend James Reyes. Investigators say Papini planned her disappearance months ahead and tricked Reyes into picking her up. 
new video showing a frightening incident at a Texas gas station involving gunfire and a hostage escaping her accused kidnapper. Houston police say the suspect allegedly took a woman against her will at gunpoint, forced her to drive on U.S. Highway 59. Officers followed them to a gas station. In the video, they can be seen exchanging gunfire in the parking lot. Police say they shot the suspect when he reached for a weapon. In another video, the hostage is seen running and being led away to safety. Police said she was not hurt. The baseball world mourning the loss of Maury Wills. The shortstop played 14 seasons in Major League Baseball, most of them with the Dodgers, with whom he won three World Series titles. Wills was noted for his base-stealing prowess and for a time held the mark for most stolen bases in a season. He was the National League MVP in 1962, became one of the first MLB All-Star Game MVPs that same year. Willis was 89 years old. The water crisis in Flint, Michigan may have taken a toll on the mental health of people there. A new study now says five years later, nearly one in four Flint residents may have PTSD and more than one in five may have depression. More than one in 10 of those same residents said they may have both and about a third said they were offered mental health services in connection. The study, published in JAMA Network Open, said that disasters like the Flint water crisis or similar incidents may require expanded mental health services to meet psychiatric need. In Las Vegas, a local elected official has been charged in the stabbing death of a local reporter arraigned on a murder charge today. Robert Tellis was assigned a court-appointed attorney and did not enter a plea. Prosecutors are weighing whether they will seek the death penalty. Tellis is accused of disguising himself and stabbing reporter Jeff Gehrman to death. Gehrman had reported on problems in Tellis's office. After recent struggles with their water system, residents of Jackson, Mississippi, have filed the first federal class action lawsuit over the contamination and failure of the city's water system. For more on that, we're joined now by Jackson, Mississippi resident Rain Becker, one of the plaintiffs in the class action suit, as well as her attorney, Mark Chalos. We thank you both so much for joining us. Uh, Rain, I'd like to start with you. You say that you've been impacted both personally as well as professionally by the failures of Jackson's water system. Uh, first, explain how this is impacting your family personally. Uh, sure. Um, so I have um, a terminally ill child. Uh, he's seven, and he's on a feeding tube. And so every time I have to give him medication or give him a feed, um, everything you put through the tube has to be flush with water and absolutely needs to be clean, sanitary water. Otherwise, the effects could be devastating. Mm. And the city has worked with the National Guard to provide as much bottled water as possible during these outages. But how have the water system failures impacted your day-to-day -day life as, 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 well, as well at work? Sure. Um, so along with the medical complications that I have with my, my child, um, all your everyday things isn't ordinary anymore, like cooking, um, cleaning, anything you would use water for is impacted. But then I also get hit uh, professionally because my main source of income is uh, working for a laundry service. So I pick up laundry at people's houses, bring them back to my house, wash them, dry them, fold them, and return them. And when we had no water for a couple of days, um, I, had, I had no income. Um, so when the water stops, my, my income essentially stops. I also um, work for some food delivery apps, but um, restaurants are suffering as well with no water. Um, so I'm having to go outside of my immediate area to deliver food to make money, but going forward it costs more. So to catch 22. And, and explain why you decided that a lawsuit is the best course of action here. What are you hoping will be achieved? We need change. We need this to be fixed. It can't be fixed for now. It can't be a temporary fix. It has to be a fix for forever. And it shouldn't have gotten to this point for this to be fixed. They knew it was a problem. They did nothing. And Mark, I'd like to bring you in here. This lawsuit is against current and former city government officials in Jackson, as well as companies involved with Jackson's public water system. So you're making the case that this is an issue of neglect or, or mismanagement instead of a lack of resources to fix these problems? 
That's right. It, it is the result of years of neglect and mismanagement. Uh, it, it is incumbent on, on a government to provide safe and clean water to its residents. The fact is here, that hasn't been done for years. The complete collapse of the system that happened in August 2022 is not a surprise. It's foreseeable. It's a result of years of, uh, of misconduct, mismanagement, and uh, failure to maintain the system. And what about the state of Mississippi? Should they bear any responsibility for getting more resources to the capital city of the state to address these issues? It is the capital city. It's the most populous city in the state. It's shameful that in 2022, a, a major American city doesn't have clean water. Uh, we're still investigating all the causes here. Uh, it certainly seems as though there's plenty of blame to go around. But first and foremost, the city needs to provide safe water to its residents. And, and Rain, I'd like to just get your, your sense here. For those of us in the United States who have not experienced the type of water crisis that you're currently dealing with, what do you feel that we should know? Um, a lot. <laughs> I think there's a lot to know. Um, I'm so thankful that the Coast Guard has stepped in. I'm so thankful that resources have stepped in to provide us clean bottle of water. Um, I believe that's still ongoing. Even though um, the water boil has been lifted, people are still not using the water. Everyone's skeptical and not wanting to use it, so. Well, we wish you both the best. Our thanks to both of you for joining us. And we should note that ABC News reached out to Jackson's mayor's office, who tells us that due to pending litigation, the city has no comment. Turning now to the economy, the Federal Reserve is set to announce another interest rate hike at 2 p.m. tomorrow. The Fed is trying to slow down inflation by slowing down the demand for goods and services and ultimately bring down prices. Here's the impact on credit card debt. If you make minimum payments on, say, $5,000 balance, so far this year you're already paying an extra $870 in interest. If the Fed hikes the rate another three-quarters of a percent, those interest payments then balloon to more than $1,100. Stocks have fallen in anticipation. The Dow downed 313 points. That's another 1%. Dr. Wendy Acefo is the definition of an accomplished woman, a professor, political analyst, and entrepreneur. She made headlines for earning her PhD in public affairs and community development from Rutgers University, the first black woman to do it in the university's history. She's also one of the most influential figures in reality TV as a cast member on Bravo's hit series, The Real Housewives of Potomac. Dr. Wendy Acefo's latest project, a memoir entitled Tears of My Mother, The Legacy of My Nigerian Upbringing, which chronicles her life from leaving Nigeria and coming to the U.S. as a child to becoming an assistant professor at John Hopkins University. And she is joining us now. Dr. Acefo, thank you so much for coming on the show. Congratulations on the book. Uh, the memoir, of thank course, you. sheds light really on, on your complicated relationship uh, with your mom and, and how your Nigerian upbringing affected your life and, and later your role as a mom yourself. How important was it for you not only to share the highlights of your life, but also some of the tougher times as well? I think it's so important because a lot of times people see what you've achieved and, you know, as you were introducing me, you were talking about some of my accolades, but it took a lot of struggle and a lot of hardship to get here. And my book really opens up that chapter and it dissects it. And it talks a lot about the immigrant experience and the first gen experience. To be quite honest with you, you know, I was raised by a single mother. So while the book examines what it's like to be a first gen immigrant in a country that is foreign to you, it's also relatable in the sense that a lot of people who were raised by a single mother, you know, have some of the same experiences in which I had, which is that of trying to please your mom and trying to make sure that you do everything you can to make sure all that she sacrificed was not in vain. And, and you're right, and I'd like to quote here. You say, I walked a constant tightrope of meeting my immigrant mother's strict expectations and upholding our Nigerian cultural traditions, but I also wanted to define myself, a first-generation immigrant raised in America, and my parenting style on my own terms. Tell me what it was like to, to carve out your own identity while still navigating the narrow path of your mother's expectations. 
It was really hard because at the same time, while you want to please those who have sacrificed for you, there comes a time in everyone's life where you decide, am I going to continue living for others or am I going to start living for myself? And it wasn't until I had children of my own when I said, I have to carve out my own lane and I have to make my own parenting experience unique to me and to that of my children. One of the most important, I think, you know, quotes I set forth is that in my life, I feel as though my mother raised me based on the world that she lived in, whereas I'm raising my children in the world they are living in. And that's a unique difference. And, and as we mentioned at the top of this uh, introduction here, you have certainly a long list of accomplishments. What do you think that your mother's high standards, what role uh, did she play in your achievements and your success? I think that for her, she really, you know, put it in my head and my siblings head that failure wasn't an option, that no matter what happens, you take it as an experience. You don't take it as something in which you look at and say, well, I failed this, so I'm going to stop. You know, I, I talk in the book about being uh, present at my mom's college graduation. When you're able to see your mom graduate college, see her go through nursing school, see her become the director of nursing, see her go through divorce and then get remarried, when you're able to see your mother go through all of those things, it really puts in perspective that, you know, nothing in this world is is not achievable. But in the same token, I think for me now as a parent, I, I want to flip that on its head to let my children know that, yes, failure is quote unquote not an option, but it's okay to, to fail. Because I think that that's when you can kind of shift the narrative. You know, being Nigerian is always a doctor, lawyer, or engineer. No, my children, they can do whatever they want. And shifting gears here, the new season of Real Housewives of Potomac starts next month. Anything that you can tell us about what we can expect? <laughs> Oh, it's a wild ride, but isn't it always? But I think this season is. is really going to keep viewers on their toes. Uh, I think that, you know, regardless of where we are in our friendships, we are really a sisterhood. And at the end of the day, we all come together. But this season is filled with so many different dynamic shifts. You see people who were once friends, no longer friends. You see people who weren't friends, now are friends. I think that the viewers are in for a treat this season. Personally, I think it's our best season to date. <laughs> Well, Wendy, we thank you so much for coming on the show. Tears of My Mother, The Legacy of My Nigerian Upbringing is now available to purchase wherever books are sold. Thank you. Before we go tonight, the image of the day, it is surfs up in Huntington Beach, California, not far from where we are in the studio here, where the ISA World Surfing Games are underway. This is Amoru Suzuki of Japan, who won a bronze medal in women's shortboard in the 2020 Summer Olympics. And that is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Coming up in the next hour, we're staying on top of a few things. A new warning about a TikTok trend. The ingredient the FDA is telling people not to put in their chicken. Hurricane Fiona lashes the Turks and Caicos Island, as many in Puerto Rico are still in the dark. Where Fiona is heading next. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7, there for you with one touch. The ABC News app, download Load it now. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. He thought he was God. He's now one of the most vilified men in the world. He is the everyman. Zelensky is the Tom Hanks of Ukraine. The fact that a little nice Jewish boy is 5'7 is showing up this AGB agent in the Kremlin. What do you say to Americans who see Russia and you not only as a rival, 
but an unfriendly adversary. Two men at war. Which Vladimir will take over? The world is not going to be the same. Amber Rose Isaac was the love of my life. She went into the hospital. And then I just see Shimani is... She was as good as dead as soon as she walked into that hospital. Black women are four times more likely to die than their white counterparts with the same symptoms. I can't let Amber be another statistic. We need to make sure that this doesn't happen to anyone else. This fight is not over. We're doing this together, man. Hi there, I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We're monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. Federal authorities charged 47 people with conspiracy and other counts in what they called the largest fraud scheme yet to take advantage of COVID funds. Prosecutors said the defendant stole $250 million by creating companies they claimed were offering food to tens of thousands of low-income kids in Minnesota. Few meals were actually served and the defendants allegedly used the money to buy luxury cars, property, and jewelry. That's all according to the U.S attorney. TikTok trends gone awry again. This time the FDA has had to actually issue a warning urging the public not to cook chicken in NyQuil. A social media video challenge tells people that they should try it, but the FDA said it could cause severe illness or even death. Boiling medication actually makes it more concentrated and just inhaling the vapors could damage the lungs. If you're feeling anxious, you are not alone. The government is encouraging you to get screened. For the first time, the U.S. Preventative Task Force is recommending primary care doctors test for anxiety in adult patients under the age of 65. The guidelines follow the rise in mental health problems tied to the pandemic. The condition can go undiagnosed for years, and it's actually one of the most common mental disorders. Tonight, Hurricane Fiona is still gaining strength as it lashes Turks and Caicos and heads north. Bermuda now potentially in its crosshairs. This is after Fiona pounded the Dominican Republic and Puerto Rico. Crews in Puerto Rico spent the day working to restore power to residents as flood waters begin to recede. But tonight, much of the island still remains without power. Victor Kendo reports once again tonight from Puerto Rico. Tonight, Fiona pounding Turks and Caicos with 115 mile per hour winds and up to eight feet of storm surge. Fiona already tearing a path of destruction through the Dominican Republic. In Puerto Rico, new video showing the Coast Guard assessing the damage Monday. We're in Toa Baja. It's a town not too far from San Juan, and this is what it looks like two days after Hurricane Fiona made landfall here. As much as 30 inches of rain in some areas already, up to four inches more expected tonight. In Utuado, where raging floodwaters destroyed that bridge, this is what it looks like today. That bridge was temporary, built after Hurricane Maria destroyed the previous one in 2017. I just feel trapped because the other way is, is broken too, so we have to go around. Roads in the area, treacherous. The U.S. territory's already fragile power grid devastated. Tonight, about 80% of customers are in the dark. This crew from Luma Energy is working on some damaged power lines here in San Juan. Take a look up at the bucket truck. They tell me this is happening across all of Puerto Rico. The power can't come back soon enough for Minerva Marquez Villalongo. Everything she owns now, she's moved it up here into these bags. She had to protect it from the floodwaters that came inside of her house. The 81-year-old has several medical conditions. She'll stay with her daughter until power is restored, happy to have family to lean on. Still has a smile intact, at least our thanks to Victor. And let's get right to Chief Meteorologist Ginger Z, who is tracking this hurricane and another storm that's brewing tonight. Hey, Ginger. Hey there, Lindsay. It was just so nice having such a slow summer, but boy, is the Atlantic making up for it. We just saw Gaston named. It'll be a fish storm, but that is about two plus weeks behind average activity. So Fiona, obviously doing so much damage throughout the Caribbean and now moving north of Turks and Caicos, is the next one we are concerned about going too close to Bermuda. So we kind of forecast there, future casted it till 5 a.m. on Friday. So that's when the 
proximity is close enough that it could cause big issues, pushing water, dropping a lot of rain, and having some wind. For mainland U.S., it's going to be far enough away that as long as you're not in the water, in the ocean, you should be fine. Rip currents, though, and high surf going to be an issue from Miami through the Outer Banks, the Mid-Atlantic, and up through coastal New England. I do want to take you, though, to the next map, and this is the one that looks super active and unfortunate because this looks much more like the activity we've seen the last couple of years. You see that X just north of South America? That's the next tropical wave, or now it's already been named an invest or an area that they're investigating. And we look at the computer models, these spaghetti plots, and most of them take it into the Western Caribbean. That would be by early next week. And then by late next week, the two models we love for long term, both taking it into the Gulf. So we'll be watching that. We've got nine, 10 days before that comes to fruition. But still, it is something to keep in mind because we are right in the heart of hurricane season, Lindsay. Right, that map just all lit up there. Ginger, our thanks to you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Now to the bitter political showdown over immigration with less than 50 days until the midterms and the criminal investigation that's now underway. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, a potential 2024 hopeful, has taken credit for the flights and the message that he wants to send to Democrats. At the same time, President Biden is under increasing pressure with border apprehensions hitting an all-time high. Rachel Scott reports. Tonight, the Biden administration pressed to explain the historic surge of migrants arrested at the southern border. More than two million apprehensions in just one year, the largest number ever. The president telling me the U.S. is seeing an increase in people fleeing political oppression. On the border, why is the border more overwhelmed under your watch, Mr. President? The fewer immigrants coming from Central America and from Mexico. This is a totally different circumstance. What's on my watch now is Venezuela, Cuba, and Nicaragua. The administration says the migrants are escaping failing communist regimes, and sending them back there is not an option. The president insists he's working with other countries to stop the flow. But border cities like El Paso, Texas are overwhelmed. Shelters at capacity, people sleeping on the streets. El Paso now busing migrants up north. With just under 50 days to go until the midterms, Republican governors sensing a political opportunity. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis flew nearly 50 migrants from San Antonio to the liberal enclave of Martha's Vineyard, making sure cameras were there to capture the scene. They were provided um, an ability to be in the, the most posh sanctuary jurisdiction maybe in the world. Democrats accused DeSantis of turning desperate people into political pawns, but the Florida governor is defiant promising more of those flights in the days to come. Our thanks to Rachel Scott. Joining us now is Bear County Sheriff Javier Salazar. Sheriff, thank you so much for coming back on the show. Uh, you've opened up a criminal investigation into this Martha's Vineyard flight. Have you questioned the parties involved who you suspect lured migrants out of the Migrant Resource Center? No, up to now, we've, we've communicated with the attorneys representing the folks in this case that, that, that we're considering to be potential victims and witnesses. Uh, we do want to get firsthand accounts from these folks to the extent possible, so right now we're in the planning stages uh, for that. We do have some persons of interest tentatively identified by name, one, at least one of them by name. I'm not at liberty to give those names, and then with some of them we just have pictures of and we're trying to get them identified. One of our political embed reporters in Florida, Miles Cohen, caught up with Governor DeSantis during a presser. He asked him specifically about you. I'd like to play a clip. How would you respond to the sheriff in Texas who's saying that these migrants were lured under false pretenses to boarding those planes? If you heard him there, he said that's false, that they were lured under false pretenses. That was the response to being asked about migrants being lured there. What's your reaction to that? Well, I, you know, look, the governor's got his opinion of what occurred. At some point, I'm going to get a good firsthand account of what occurred. And, and maybe the governor and I just have to agree to disagree on the facts of the case. Do you consider the transportation of these migrants to be human trafficking? Well, it could be. Uh, you know, once we get to talk to these folks uh, in person and we find out exactly what was said and done while they were here in Bear County, because let's be frank, that's the only part of this, this whole incident that I have any control over is what physically occurred in my county. If we're able to prove up that they were, they were transported from here under false pretenses, uh, that could, uh, uh, could be tantamount to criminal conduct and it will be dealt with accordingly. 
a lack of resources seems to be really the recurring theme with our immigration system and the border. How far do you plan to take this criminal investigation? And does your county have the resources to possibly build a case against a sitting governor of another state if the evidence calls for that? Well, look, I think it's a bit of a stretch at this point to say that we're putting a case on the on the on the governor. Uh, we've actually never said that. What what I what I do plan is finding out what did the people that were physically here in my county, what did they say and do to these people? And those are the folks that I say I can say we're concentrating our efforts on. Beyond that, I don't know what what may become necessary, but I can tell you that uh, we will have to make resources uh, you know, to, to hold folks accountable. At this point, I can't say that I'm going to be holding anybody outside of my county responsible for anything. Uh, but once, once it comes to that point, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. You'll follow wherever the investigation leads, it sounds like. And we had you on our show almost three months ago after that horrible human smuggling tragedy that left 53 dead. You were sounding the alarm well mm -hmm. before then. You've written three letters to President Biden. Here you are sounding the alarm again. Uh, you told us that you had reached out, but did you ever have a, a concrete meeting or any kind of true correspondence? No, there really hasn't been an, uh, a meaningful meeting uh, to this point. I mean, we, we did receive, I did receive a phone call from somebody uh, in the administration that, that we tried to, tried to get something going and it just never came to fruition. And quite frankly, we've had two additional deaths in my county since then that we know of that we're handling. Uh, and so the problem is still there. It's not going anywhere anytime soon. And these problems, like what we're confronting right now, are, are kind of offshoot issues uh, from the from the big main issue that we've we've got a humanitarian crisis going on. How do you feel that that should be, or what are at least some initial steps in trying to solve and tackle that crisis? Well, you know, realizing I'm not the president, realizing I'm not a sitting governor, I'm a cop. Uh, I can bring some some what I think are common sense approaches from a from a 30 year cops perspective. Uh, and I'm certainly willing to do that. I'll give my opinion to whoever asks for it, and maybe even some people that don't ask for it are going to get it. Um, but but certainly, I'm, I'm, I, I, I don't purport to have all of the solutions, but I'm willing to be part of the solution if somebody will just uh, you know come to Texas and, and let's discuss it. Bear County Sheriff Javier Salazar, we thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Be safe. You too. Now to the war in Ukraine, where Russia's Vladimir Putin has addressed his nation to call for young men to join the fight, while officials in eastern regions of Ukraine sympathetic to Russia are making moves to try to separate to become part of Russia. ABC's Tom Sufi Burge reports from Ukraine. Tonight, a major escalation from Vladimir Putin, moving to officially declare large areas of eastern and southern Ukraine part of Russia planning to stage referendum votes starting this week. President Zelensky tonight dismissing the moves as noise and thanking allies for condemning Russia. It comes as Putin suffers heavy battlefield losses. Tonight, Ukrainian troops marching into this newly liberated village in the eastern Donbass region. The White House today slamming Russia's planned referendums as a sham. These are not the actions of a confident country. These are not acts of strength, quite the opposite. And tonight, the Ukrainian military releasing new video, claiming it shows Russian incendiary bombs raining down on a recently retaken village in the eastern Donbass region. We visited that mass burial site in Izium, revealed after the Russian retreat. There we met Alexander, his son missing for weeks since Russian soldiers raided his apartment. Alexander's son, Alexander, had picked up a Ukrainian military jacket that he found, and potentially that was the only crime he committed in the eyes of the Russian authorities. I had a bad dream, he told us, and then I realized I would never see my son again. Our thanks to Tom for that. Now to the battle over the classified documents retrieved from Mar-a-Lago. The new special master today met with former President Trump's attorneys and lawyers from the Justice Department, pressing Trump's team to provide evidence to support Trump's claims that the documents had, in fact, been declassified. ABC's chief justice correspondent, Pierre Thomas, has the latest. Donald Trump was the one who wanted a special master in this case. And tonight, the judge appointed to that role pushing the former president's attorneys to provide evidence he declassified hundreds of documents discovered at his Mar-a-Lago home, many marked secret and top secret. Publicly, Trump has claimed he declassified the documents before leaving office. 
a president has that absolute right. But Trump's attorneys have not repeated those claims in court or in any legal filings. Judge Raymond Deary essentially telling them it's time to prove it. If the government gives me evidence these are classified documents and you don't advance declassification claims, then as far as I'm concerned, that's the end of it. You can't have your cake and eat it too. Judge Deary pointed to those labels on some of the documents, secret and top secret, saying, if they are on their face classified without any evidence to the contrary, how is it on the court to conclude anything but? And the judge making it clear he considered the handling of classified information a serious matter, saying, the government has a strong obligation to all of us to see that the information doesn't get into the wrong hands. Our thanks to Pierre. Investigators are trying to figure out what caused an explosion in Chicago that tore through an apartment building. The blast nearly took off the top floor, leaving windows shattered and scattering bricks onto the ground. Eight people were sent to the hospital, some of them with severe burns. Emergency teams, including the ATF and bomb squad, were also called to the scene. A local gas company says it does not believe gas is what caused this explosion. We turn next to the California mom, sentenced to 18 months in prison for faking her 2016 disappearance after claiming that she had been abducted by two non-existent Hispanic women. Her sentencing has unsealed a trove of evidence from the police interrogation, including details on the moment her husband learned the truth. ABC's chief national correspondent, Matt Gutman, has this story. Sherry Papini, the California mom who pleaded guilty to faking her own kidnapping, sentenced to 18 months in prison. And now, in an interrogation video obtained by ABC News, we're seeing the moment police confronted Papini with her lies. Husband Keith by her side. The reason why you can describe the room is because you stayed in the room in the dark for hours, for days on end. In November of 2016, Papini vanished. The search for her gaining international attention. Three weeks later, Thanksgiving morning, she was found on a highway seen here bound in chains. Her breathless cries captured on this 911 call. I need you to listen to me. <laughs> Papini had claimed that two Hispanic women had kidnapped, beaten, even branded her. Injuries seen in images obtained by ABC News, her husband tearfully describing her condition to me just days after her return. Her poor face. I got like nauseated just looking at her. The bruises were just intense. But three years later, police would trace DNA on Papini to an ex-boyfriend, James Reyes. Police say Papini planned it all, tricking Reyes into taking her to his home where she self-inflicted those injuries, some with his help. I didn't do anything wrong. But when confronted with the evidence, Papini finally seems to break. Talking to other guys that has got me here. <laughs> How does talking to other people got you here? Well, you've gotten over. But for Keith Papini, that police interrogation changed everything. You're telling me, okay, you guys can go home now. Well, do you think I want her anywhere around my kids or around me at all at this point? Matt Gutman joins us now. And Matt, the judge's sentence was harsher than even prosecutors had requested. What was the rationale given for that? Lizzie, prosecutors had asked for eight months. The judge handed down an 18-month sentence. He said he needed copycats to know that crime doesn't pay, that people don't want to be conned. But he also noted the sheer number of Papini's victims, including the Hispanic community, which was maligned and targeted by years of Sherry's lies about being abducted at gunpoint by two Spanish-speaking women. And we should note that Keith Papini, the husband, has since filed for divorce from his wife, Lindsay. All right, Matt Gutman, our thanks to you. And still to come, the new allegations from an investigation into the killing of a Palestinian-American journalist in Israel. Plus, it's a site where you can find information on just about anything. What's now inspiring more young people to add their own entries to Wikipedia? This is ABC News Live. The crush of families Trump. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. 
Swing them all. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? Can <laughs> I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated ABCNews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at ABCNews.com. And here's to everything ahead. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. Welcome back. We're tracking several headlines around the world. An investigation by two groups, one in London and the other Palestinian, released new evidence in the killing of veteran Al Jazeera journalist Shireen Abu Akleh. The new report contradicts the Israeli military's finding that the shooting was likely by an Israel sniper, but a mistake, concluding it was not a mistake that the sniper who shot the journalist knew the area had media personnel and continued to shoot while some tried to rescue Abu Akleh. The new report was released on the same day that the victim's family submitted a complaint to the International Criminal Court to demand justice for her killing. About 14 sperm whale carcasses were discovered in Australia's King Island. Experts are now investigating the stranding, while authorities are planning ways to try to remove the bodies, but said that they might not be able to. Strandings have been reported in the area before, but the reasons remain unknown. After Hurricane Fiona destroyed many parts of the Dominican Republic, residents are now finding ways to rebuild their homes. Volunteers handed out bags of food on the street after the hurricane destroyed crops that many people are so dependent upon. Hurricane Fiona is the first major natural disaster to affect the country since 2014, causing floods and power outages affecting thousands. From chess, boxing, turkey bowling to the Pope Mobile, you can find peculiar yet vital information on Wikipedia. It gives people power. It gives power to the people, I should say, who are the editors of its content. And a young and passionate influencer is inspiring others to add to it. ABC's Juju Chang has the story. There's a special place online where you can go to get your quirky, nerdy fix, where you can learn the art of chess boxing, or the history of the Pope Mobile. Now the Pope's progress is happening now. Or the life story of Jonathan, the world's oldest living tortoise. Nuggets of knowledge showcased on the social media hotspot Depths of Wikipedia, all curated by Annie Rewerta with one million well-intentioned, sometimes nerdy followers. Pufferfish had this mating ritual where the males attract females by making elaborate sand sculptures. This is so wholesome and cute to me. Um, I feel like this would work on me. Jane Goodall studied chimpanzees for 60 years and still stated that dogs were her favorite animal. And I feel like that just really goes to show that you don't have to mix business and pleasure. It all began in her University of Michigan dorm room, where Annie became a connoisseur of the world's largest online encyclopedia. I think it's a crazy hobby to write encyclopedia articles for free, but it's also very empowering and a little bit maddening and also very fun. You're writing history in real time and you can do it from your computer. You don't have to be famous or powerful or pay a lot of money. The recent college grad taking her social media fame across the country, reaching an even wider audience with her live show, bringing her unique potpourri of info comedy to the stage. Wikipedia has everything you need. It's got sexually active popes. We've got fictional raccoons, 69 of them. We have a, a reminder that humans can send a man to the moon, literally no, no big deal. We can't figure out the biggest sofa that can fit around the corner. The show is a live adaptation of the Depths of Wikipedia Instagram account. Uh, where we bring on audience contestants to play games. We bring on comedians who embody the depths of Wikipedia ethos. 
I wanted to talk about the way like me, just sort of a humble, normal gay guy uses Wikipedia, and that's basically researching B and C list actresses, <laughs> period. <laughs> this is one of my favorite sentences on the entire site of wikipedia.org. Uh, in 2002, John Paul II requested that the media stop referring to the car as the Pope-mobile, saying the term was undignified. <laughs> anyway, the Pope-mobile, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Annie's really passionate about making people not just consumers of Wikipedia, but contributors to Wikipedia, right? Like the only reason that Wikipedia exists uh, is because people, passionate people, have donated their time to build this incredible resource. She also hosts Wikipedia edit-a-thons, like this one, here at the Brooklyn Creative League in Clinton Hill, sponsored by the nonprofit Wikimedia Foundation teaching amateur Wikipedians to give a little love to underrepresented topics. Uh, we'll write it and then we'll add some citations in. In order to be represented on Wikipedia, we need to have a reliable source to write about it, which means that very much Wikipedia um, reinforces many of the existing biases and inequities um, that are out there in the larger literature. The Wikipedia articles predominantly represent uh, white cisgender men. When Wikipedia first started, um, it was more of the Wild West, and the whole idea is pretty crazy. If anyone can edit an uh, encyclopedia, how could it possibly be better than just memes and silly jokes? Since the early days, I do think that it's improved a lot, it's, and that's thanks to so many volunteers who defend free knowledge for no money, just for passion. Whether it's the Bodega Cats, Extreme Ironing, or Turkey Bowling. Annie's passion fostering a community to help keep Wikipedia weird and wonderful. I kind of agree with the Pope that Pope Mobile doesn't sound too dignified, but our thanks to Juju Chang for that. Still to come, two high school football teams go head to head on the gridiron. Why this game may have made history. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24 Seven. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award winning, powerful, eye opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. Ready for a little GMA ish promo? Okay, here we go. GMA 7A every day with Robin, George, and Michael. That's how you start the day. Boom! America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Welcome back. Two women who are each head coaches of boys' varsity teams in Chicago went head-to-head -head in a game in what was believed to be the first-ever varsity high school football game featuring two female head coaches. Will Jones from our partner station, WLS, has a story in tonight's Local Lowdown. This is an historic occasion. Put it in the history books. Tonight, for the first time ever, two women head football coaches and their teams played each other on the gridiron. An unprecedented head-to-head -head matchup between Fanger and DuSable High Schools. I just want to thank my mom. Everybody got to thank their mom, Pearl Mayfield. Fanger High School head coach Jocelyn Mayfield is the third woman to lead a Chicago Public League football team. And to know that we broke a national glass ceiling is over the top amazing. DuSable High School head coach Konisha Ray is the second woman to coach football in the CPL. <laughs> also on the field tonight, IHSA referee Adam McChristian. Girl power, an obvious understatement. 
Coach Mayfield and Coach Ray are also close friends. Banger takes this one in a lopsided win. I'm thankful that my sister got her first victory. Even though it was against me, but my sister got her first victory. Who got my back? I got your back. Who got my back? It's not the final score this game will be remembered for, and Coach Mayfield taking a moment to absorb what really mattered tonight. There's no losses to me. That scoreboard to me don't mean anything, because what means something to me is me and this young lady share a historic moment. Here, so that's my W regardless. Girl power all around. That's our show for tonight. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Have a great night. America's number one news, ABC.